Well, alongside thousands of his fellow veterans, Afghanistan war veteran Paul Jacobs attended the Cenotaph Remembrance Service in central London yesterday, honouring those who made the ultimate sacrifice. But he was just a little bit preoccupied because during the ceremony, the war hero lost his beloved beret, which he's had for 18 years, until a network of London black cab drivers got together and came to the rescue. And Paul joins us now. Well, welcome to Good Morning Britain. Welcome. It's fantastic to have you in the studio this morning. To be awarded the George Medal, what an incredible moment that must have been. It was a moment, yeah. <laughs> and hearing that story again sort of takes it back. It's, uh, yeah, it's 15 years on for me now, um, completely blind, so a whole different experience, a whole different life. But, you know, we march on and, um, yeah, I suppose it's really about me losing my beret yesterday. It is, because, of course, yesterday you wanted to go to the Cenotaph, of course, to honour all of those who didn't make it home. This is the theme I've heard from so many veterans. You don't consider yourselves the heroes, despite the fact you've been awarded the George Medal for your courage, for your own self-sacrifice. But the heroes are those who didn't make it back. So you, you were there yesterday but your beloved Beret went missing. Now, tell us why that was so <laughs> sort of painful for you. Well, yeah, obviously, Remembrance Day, Remembrance Weekend is, um, is really the only weekend that we have in the whole year to remember the fallen, remember the injured, and be united as one, one country to remember mm -hmm. the past and, um, mm -hmm. and more so the present. Mm -hmm. um, so... I was going to get on the tube, etc., and uh, I was walking out and I had my blazer, which I'm wearing now, and my beret, and my beret slipped out of my pocket and it was left in a car park. And uh, I didn't realise until I got to the other side of London, up to the Cenotaph, and then put out a message and the black cabs, the veteran charity black cabs were amazing. Um, the only thing I'm scared of, though, is I hope it's not on their toll system, like, you know what I mean? Because, <laughs> uh, blind me, you know what so I mean? It's going to cost me a fortune. So they scoured London, basically? They, until they, they did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was and, amazing. And somebody found it in the car park? Somebody found it in the car, put it on a fence, took a photo, yeah. and then a really kind um, former Royal Green Jacket, a fellow called David, who's a black cab driver, mm. who lives round by my way, he, um, picked it up and delivered it to me, hand-delivered it to me last Fantastic. night when I got in. And why was... is it so important to you, Paul? That's Dave Hempstead, I just want to point oh, out yeah. there. Oh, what so a we... lovely fella. It's well... the first time I met him, but we're from the same unit, and um, what a lovely fella. So, we... hang on, so he, he he's a volunteer driver, is he, with the Taxi Charity for Military Veterans? That's right, yeah, and he said he's done trips to uh, Norway and things like that, and Normandy, and, mm. yeah. And then he goes and rescues your beret... And, and reunites it with it. Well, well done to Dave, mm. because that was... You know, the, it would have been such a loss if you, if you hadn't got that back. Just, yeah, tell us why it's so important to you to have it back. Well, the berry itself represents my unit. Right. But it's what's inside my berry, which is a coin that was given to me to a, by a dear, dear friend. I wonder if I can just take the berry Yeah, no, please, please, you. yeah, yeah. So is that, that a coin? If that's all right. There's a coin inside, a silver coin that was given to me by... My uh, secondary school teacher, who told me to go and join the army, um, I used to go stay at her house and she was just absolutely adorable, lovely lady. Unfortunately, she died a few years ago now, a lady called Wendy Dar. Mm. And she gave me this coin. And this coin on one side says hope, and on the other side it was a kneeling angel. And that's been with me on every patrol, um, yeah, Everest, Kilimanjaro, any activity I do, I take that with me. Absolutely. So it's, it's, it is the repository of all those memories and achievements. And it's her believing in me still, yeah. Yes. Mm. So watching the, the report, we, the summary we had of your extraordinary life and your terrible experience out there, mm. um, you were blinded in an instant. I mean, one minute you can see and the next second you can't. How long did it take you to adapt to being completely blind? Well, I think you have to look at three, three aspects here. You've got to look at the physical, then you've got to look at the mental and then the emotional. <laughs> so the physical, that went pretty rapidly because... I'm in a hospital, we're around, I'm around all the other blokes and lasses where we've all got injuries, so we're all sort of taking the mick and getting on top of it and yeah. helping each other. But it's once you leave that and you're no longer a soldier, a sailor or an airman, mm. you lose that camaraderie and you just become Paul. Right. Paul from Ramsgate in his community and now it's down to the community to pick you up. It's mm. your community. And it was my community that picked me up, Thanet. 
Thanet. Thanet, yeah, yeah, the Isle of Thanet, yeah. Yeah, it was definitely them and the people around me. I'm, so I'm an orphan, I'm from the, the system, so okay. it was my community that helped me. And how many years was it? Maybe it wasn't even years, but how long was it before you felt that you'd adjusted to this new reality where you couldn't see? I think we're always adjusting. And um, the physical I'm over, it's probably for the rest of my life, the mental and the emotional. Mm. Mm. Tell us about yesterday and who you were remembering at the Cenotaph. Well, yesterday for me was... Um, was obviously to remember when I was injured, which was in August, the 20th of August, um, a legend, a fellow called Sergeant Paul McAleese, whose father was Johnny McAleese, SAS, Arabian Embassy. Um, that was his father. Um, mm. Paul McAleese was um, my sniper sergeant. Really spot-on fella, really got on with him. I didn't know Johnny who was killed that day. He was a different unit. Um, I didn't know him that well, but another super-duper geezer. And then, previous to that, we had a... Um, which is the image that always stays with me at Cenotaph, is uh, the five blokes that were killed in one, one patrol and seven walking wounded. Mm. So that's an injured major all the way down to rifleman. Mm. Um, and the youngest? Was 18-year-old William Aldridge, a really, really dear friend of mine. Barely out of school at 18. I don't think he could even shave. <laughs> <laughs> but what a geezer. <laughs> We've, we saw, as we always do every November, we saw this kind of, it's a cliche to say it, but it's cliches tend to be true, this outpouring of warmth mm -hmm. uh, from everybody in the country, mm -hmm. watching the, the, the services, the remembrance service on the Saturday night at the Albert Hall and, and, and yesterday. How, how helpful is that to someone like you, knowing that there are millions and millions of people basically expressing their, their love for you and their admiration for you, all of you? Well, like I said, it starts with a community, doesn't it? Mm. And getting behind our veterans, getting behind our armed forces is so important because we can't do it without the love. We can't be on tour without the, the MFO boxes being sent with the toiletries and the sweeties and the comics and whatever right. else. So it's so important that the nation is right behind our armed forces, mm. right behind our veterans. And what I feel is that it's the only time veterans get to talk and our sense of humour, the veteran <laughs> sense of humour, which has got us through our darkest days, yes. which a lot of other people don't understand, and they shouldn't be offended when veterans come together. No, because it's your time. It's our time. It's your time. That's right, we only yeah. get two days of the year, Armed Forces Day yeah. and Remembrance Day, yeah. and it shouldn't be made into politics, it should be made about the veterans yeah, and the yeah. Armed Forces. I must ask you one question, again, from, from that report, um, all the achievements that, that you've, you've mastered since losing your sight, and one of them is boxing. How do you box when you can't see? <laughs> They don't, they don't show you the photo of the state of my face afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> but are you boxing by sound or instead? How does it work? Uh, how does it work? So I'm basically getting my head punched in, but I sort of give, <laughs> give, it, give it my bestest. Um, you work out where the punch came from and, and hit back as quick as you can. So basically, me and you are in the ring now. We touch gloves, I'm going to punch you straight in the face and then I'm going to let you walk me down onto the ropes and then I'm just going to, yeah, we'll just go for it. <laughs> <laughs> it could be a charity do, if you like. I love it. I love it. Well, it sounds like you're up for it, Paul Richard. <laughs> OK. Punch me in the face any time you like. Listen, let us give you your, your, your berry back. Yeah. That's very kind of you. Thank no, you very much. Very kind of you to bring it in. Thank We're so you. glad you reunited. Ah, oh, bless you. Huge um, thanks to well the done, drivers of London. Dave Hempstead, absolutely right. Paul, it's just an <sighs> honour to meet you. It certainly is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for being here. And uh, thanks to your fallen comrades as bless well. You. Really yeah, important yeah. day. Thank you so much. Thank you.